G'day, how are you going? It's Phil Tarrant here, host of the Smart Product Investment Show. I hope you're well. Getting stuck into 2022 and here we are, nearly March. Uh, who would have thought that happened so quickly? Uh, a lot of news at the moment. Um, uh, you know, either tune into any of the different outlets, you'll know there's a federal election underway. Uh, I was myself up in Darwin the last couple of days um, uh, for a number of different things and they had both uh, the Prime Minister and also the opposition leader up there they were flying the flag it was for the 80th commemoration uh, of the bombing of darwin and they were there obviously politicizing uh, everything that's happening on right now uh that's a big thing for 2022 interest rate discussions happening as we speak uh we'll get a bit into that uh today borders are opening up uh fortress australia just let down its walls uh so we're now having uh, international travellers coming back into it without too much restrictions. So that's good to see. So lots going on. Uh, and uh, for a lot of different people, they can interpret that. What does it mean for them? But this show, it's a property show. We talk about property, property investment. What does all that mean for property investors for 2022? You'd be thinking, if you listen to some of the banks, that you're going to start seeing rate hikes by June this year. Who knows? Consensus seems to be August, but you probably need to speak to the Reserve Bank uh, governor to see exactly when that's going to take place. We wait anxiously for the first Tuesday of March to see where we're going to go. But the question is, where do we invest in 2022 and where those risks are, where those opportunities are? We're going to get stuck into it today. We've got our friends from Open Corp joining us in the studio from Brisbane and Melbourne, and I'm in Sydney, so it is a nationwide podcast. I'm Matt Lewis, and he's the CEO, a regular uh, guest on the Smart Point Investment Show, and Michael Beresford. Director of Investment Services. You may remember him. He was on about a year or so ago and he's back. Michael, Matt, how are you going? You well? Yeah, great, Phil. It's good to be here again. Likewise, Phil. Good to be joining you. Yeah, so uh, we've got Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. So we're covering the East Coast of Australia here in terms of uh, uh, property dynamics. And some people will say, well, Tasmania is part of that as well. Uh, and it's sort of bubbling along at the moment, Tasmania. So we don't forget about you, Tasmania. Do not worry. But I do sometimes get criticism that we don't talk about Tasmania too much. So we'll do more of that moving forward. And also Darwin. I was in Darwin last week. Um, that was pretty interesting. Again, it doesn't get a lot of information. Uh, seems to be overlooked when it comes to property investment. Uh, Matt, you're the sort of brains trust with data down there at Open Corp or up there at Open Corp. What do you reckon about Darwin? Let's kick off with that, mate. I was just, just interested in, in what your thoughts are. Yeah, well, look, it's interesting because, I mean, Darwin, everywhere in Australia has been um, benefiting from the, the conditions over the last year. And I think, uh, what do they say, all ships float in a rising tide. And uh, certainly Darwin um, seems like it's had a good run as well from, from the perspective of price growth, um, as, has, as has Hobart. I just want to make sure that we don't forget about them. Um, so I reckon anybody who's been an investor in Australia in the last year, whether they're in Darwin, Hobart, Adelaide, Perth, Sydney, would be pretty happy with themselves and very glad that they bought property um, in or before 2021. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so obviously Dar Darwin's been looking good now. Probably the bigger question is not what it's done in the in the past, what it's going to do in the future, and that's probably one of the things that is the the key now because we're moving from a market where everything has done well, and we're moving into a market where there's a bit more uncertainty. As you said, there's interest rates that are potentially going up. What's that going to do? There's immigration changes, um, and and there's markets that are in very different positions, and we we certainly expect there's going to be some of that divergence moving forward we're going to see some markets really outperform others um, and parts we, even within certain cities are going to uh, to perform well while other parts are going to to underperform so um, I, I mean I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to tarnish any any particular city but certainly the fundamentals in Darwin right now probably aren't looking as as strong as some of the other cities um, just in terms of vacancy rates currently and uh, and stop going to market and, and turnover. You know, I completely agree with you there, Matt. And the best investors I know are the ones that are able to sort of disconnect with the noise or the emotional connection they have with any particular area. The best investors will put their money in the right asset at the right time that's going to get the best outcome for them. But what it reminded me sort of heading up and down and having a, a good look around was the value of uh, looking beyond the data uh, mm -hmm. to get the ground truth. So I really enjoy traveling around Darwin and, and looking at the market up there and seeing what's going yep. on. And just, just really, um, uh, you know, giving me a sense for the realities of different sort of cities, different capital cities or different locations. 
and Darwin itself is it's a nice place to, to live. It's hot. I'll tell you that. It's a wet season right now. It's been a lot of development around the waterfront. There's a lot of apartments have gone in. Uh, not a lot of um, transactions taking place, which I found really interesting, but just really give me a sense for that area. Palmerston City uh, to the south of Darwin, um, I had no idea the significance of that particular area. And it's either already or it will be much bigger than Darwin uh, in time. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a huge area right there. So able to ca- calibrate myself and get the ground truth, actually the reality of, yeah. of looking at property markets up there, irrespective of whether it's Darwin or whatever, uh, if you're investing in property, sometimes it's worth actually getting boots on the ground uh, and having a look around. Well, I could, couldn't couldn't have said it better myself. I think um, sometimes getting out, and that's the one downside of the last couple of years. It's been a lot harder to travel, drive around, see what's get, see what's getting built, the infrastructure, new shopping centres, and things like that, um, and opening your eyes up to different areas. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, I think one of the the great things about property is that if you if you have a bit more knowledge than than the next person and you've got a much higher opportunity or probability of, of making money if you're better informed and part of being informed is is sometimes as you said getting boots on the ground and even talking to to the people in the market so I'm, i was curious to ask actually when you were in darwin what's the word on the street like what, what's what's their view of the market well it's funny darwin and and I'm sure this probably lends itself to, to your skill set inside of uh, OpenCorp. Matt, there's a whole bunch of moving parts uh, up there at the moment, and a lot of it is uh, political. A lot of it is strategic as well. Darwin is really the, the center of the Indo-Pacific right now. So yep. strategically for Australia, it's it's a very important area. You've got uh, a considerable amount of investment up there in terms of defense spending. Uh, if you want a job uh, and if you're a tradie, go to Darwin and you'll be able to make yourself a good earn up there. I'll tell you that for nothing, but um, it's a yeah. whole bunch of moving parts up there, whether or not the government is supportive of growth, um, accelerated growth. Um, I think they are. Uh, the nuances of the market is considerable, but it's uh, who knows? Like I, I can't see Darwin doubling in size or, or the Northern Territory doubling size in 10 years time. I, I think it's hard living up there. Uh, it's a very transient, uh, it's a very transient um, population. Uh, people sort of spend their time in Darwin and leave. And I think as a property investor, is that a good thing? Maybe if you've got a good investment property, there's always going to be people moving in there. But I can't see accelerated uh, population growth up there. And for me, that's probably a big uh, thing as a property investor. But the sage reminder for me was go and have a look around. You know, you, mm-hmm. when you hear about Darwin or you hear about that particular area, it's good that we can concentrate on Darwin a little bit, but um, you, you hear all this noise around the, the Chinese port up there. Um, you know, actually going to have a look at that, I was like, I was pretty underwhelmed. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's. I went, uh, is is that it? Is it like for some reason I thought it was going to look like, you know, botany or, or or whatever, you know? But it's literally, you know, you can park up a boat, you know, maybe two if you're lucky. Uh, it wasn't a significant um, uh, architecture. It wasn't a significant engine that I thought it was going to be. I was like. Wow, yeah. that's pretty pretty underwhelming. Yeah, and I think that's the um, isn't that the the concern for government was that it was just a strategic asset for for a Chinese uh, entity, perhaps. And and I mean we're we're all kind of well and truly in the outer stands of the sidelines when it comes to to seeing the inner workings of a um, of government and all those geopolitical issues going on so we have to take things at face value at time but uh yeah look i think probably even darwin when you talk about population growth i mean darwin's really often led by the armed services decision so if you put in if if the australian government decides they're going to send in more troops and they're going to build out an army base and kind of add to that then absolutely we see a big spike in population growth generally pushes up rents pushes up prices but they tend to be um intermittent as opposed to a steady uh, escalation in population which as I said it kind of goes up and down which um, I, I would have thought a few months ago probably six seven months ago in Darwin vacancy rates were low there wasn't a lot of stock on the market we've seen without kind of any any major changes the new stock or the, the amount of stock hitting the market weekly rental listings are going out and prices of prices have started to plateau as a result so it is I guess the the size of the city means that it can change direction reasonably quickly one of the great things about Sydney, I suppose, and even Melbourne, they're really big cities, big population bases, and 
the wheels turn um, turn slowly at times. So it takes a, mm. a while to build up momentum, but it also takes a while for that momentum to to switch off, which kind of gives a bit of um, bit of comfort and confidence in, uh, I guess, in making investment decisions. Yeah, and 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 for Darwin, and, and you see it elsewhere, but for Darwin or, or the sort of the the northern end of Australia. Um, you're going to see considerable investment moving forward in terms of defence spending. Uh, all the bases up there are getting huge investment put into it. Again, that's good for, for jobs and growth and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you've got the marine rotation happens through Darwin. Um, they need places to live and everything that's surrounding it. You probably see more of it moving forward. Uh, for me, Darwin's it's, it's it's there to watch, but it's still a tough town to live in, right? I, I don't know. I, I can't get it. But this is sort of like, you know, all these different things moving on. We talk about Darwin, you're talking about geopolitics, you're talking about how that's going to shape property markets. You look at sort of as Australia moves out of the um, the pandemic, uh, how things are going to um, uh, move moving forward. You know, you've got C and tree changes, people moving to regional areas as a result of uh, more flexibility with work. Who knows what's going on? Uh, and this market, more than probably anything that I've been involved in some time is 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 a little bit more precarious because no one yet knows exactly what's going to happen. Um, fix that in with interest rate changes and all that sort of stuff, elections and whatnot. So, you know, the strategies that worked last year probably aren't going to work as effectively in 2022. And that's the question I have for, for you guys today. Um, and I know you're about to release a report over the next uh, week or so, um, your Q1 2022 market insights. This is something you guys release quite regularly. Matt, is that one of your babies is uh, you sort of steer that through Open Corp. Uh, yeah, look, it's something we've been we've had for a long time, but it's been an internal document. So we developed that for um, for our investment committee for our investment decisions and the investment committee of our our fund Resi Fund um, to to ensure that we're we're forward looking and we we have a really kind of we're ground truthing, I guess, our decisions, um, but. I mean, the things that uh, that are at play, you touch on a few of them. You've got interest rates competing with vacancy, rental vacancy rates and uh, unemployment versus Im- immigration. And there's so many things that are kind of balancing off against each other that it, it does make it really hard, hard to predict. I mean, if interest rates, there's obviously talk about putting interest rates up, but at the same time, we've got rental vacancy rates at almost all time lows nationally. So, well, if you put interest rates up and you turn off uh, some investment in housing, then you most likely, or the RBA would would kind of need to know that they're likely impacting rents that people are going to be paying in the future because all of a sudden, in a year's time, there's less uh, less new stock coming to market. The tenants are paying more, and it's 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 a big challenge for them to to balance those things off. But it's probably not the first time we've seen uncertainty like this. And I know um, Michael is probably what, 2017, um, we, we saw a similar situation in Sydney and Melbourne where um, there was obviously, there was a changes in the financial regulation and um, created a lot more uncertainty, but there were still winners uh, in the market. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, you guys have, have mentioned the term fundamentals quite a lot already in the, uh, in the conversation. And that's, that's something that uh, we're always talking to our clients about and investors about trying to help them stay focused on, on what those fundamentals are. Uh, affordability is obviously a key one. Uh, demand and supply are the other, the other major two. Uh, you know, we, we were seeing situations in, in Melbourne 20, 2016 to 2018 where clients had bought, uh, you know, just before these, these lending restrictions came in or those that could service, you know, even once those announcements had happened, um, because I think it's important to remember that the, the lending restrictions weren't a single decision. It was a phasing on of, of uh, increased restriction between 2015 and, and early 2017. Uh, and those clients that, you know, for example, were buying in Melbourne uh, in different pockets, we were somewhere between 450 and, and 550, depending on land size. Uh, you know, those properties today are uh, a 750 to 900 depending on land size. So, uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a relatively short time frame where property is concerned. And within that time frame, it hasn't just been uh, lending restrictions, but, uh, you know, obviously COVID as well. And if you, if you lined all these uh, potential negatives up um, or potential impacts to the property market uh, and paid attention on those as opposed to the fundamentals, then, 
you know, you would have missed out on a lot of growth in that time. Yeah, a lot of this covered off um, in your Q1 2022 markets insight. So that's Jan to March uh, this year, uh, where to invest in 2022, risks, and also trends to keep an eye out for. You can download it uh, just in the show notes. You should be able to track it down or just Google Open Corp um, Market Insights Report. You'll be able to track it down there, download it and check it out. But one of the key sort of questions I have around it all, Michael, is, you know, in your sense, you've been at this for a little while, um, you know, how is the market looking right now compared to previous cycles? If you're a first-time investor, would you be looking at property as a as an asset class thinking this is something I need to be involved in or potentially I probably missed it by a couple of years. I should have been in that sort of 22, 25% uh, cycle of growth that that we've seen over the last year or so. Yeah, it's it's a good question, Phil. And I guess one one thing I've learned over nearly twenty years in in property uh, is the best time to buy was twenty years ago. The second best times as soon as you can. So it's really important when considering property investment to do it well. You need to be taking you know a long term approach. And if you take a long term approach and you you focus on those fundamentals, then yeah, it's a uh, it's a pretty good pretty good recipe for success. So, you know, when we consider, um, as as Matt was saying earlier, I think the most important thing to consider for for twenty twenty two and beyond uh, is that we're not we're not going to see we had we had a really rare occurrence last year where all of the four major capital cities saw you know upwards of thirteen percent growth uh, in a twelve month period. Uh, it's far more. Uh, typical for markets to go through cycles and for some to be growing while others are, are, are growing strongly while others are growing moderately and, and others you know uh, plateauing or or even um, uh, you know contracting a little bit in terms of median house price movements so uh, I think it's important to remember that 2021 was a, a bit of an anomaly um, in that regard moving forward the the uh, what we're going to see, I think, is that some investors will do really, really well, um, you know, versus others that uh, that probably won't do so well, depending on what they focus on and where they where they choose to invest. So, what is always fundamental is by by um, focusing on on these fundamentals. It ensures, as you said before, looking at the right asset in the right location at the right time of the market. That's the formula. Uh, you know, what we're seeing in terms of people that we're speaking to just in the last six to 12 months is, especially in, in Sydney as affordability constraints have really started to buy it, that uh, people that were, were typically you know, more comfortable only looking within the suburb that they live, uh, now kind of accepting and understanding that there are opportunities you know, more broadly than that. Uh, there, are, there are different locations within the capital cities that they live in or, or even more widely different capital cities around Australia that provide uh, you know, really good opportunities um, because they're markets that haven't seen the same kind of growth. And I'm talking about you know, uh, still parts of Brisbane, absolutely. Um, don't focus so much on the nearly 30% that it's up. You know, it's, uh, it's just starting at cycle compared to Sydney and Melbourne that, uh, that are up you know, 90 to 100%. Uh, at a maximum in the last uh, in the last eight years or so, uh, Perth as well, obviously you know very affordable um, and rents up dramatically. Um, I know I've seen my one you know my property in Perth the rents up one hundred and forty five dollars a week since March last year. So uh, yeah, there there are absolutely markets that provide great opportunities for investors if you're focused on the right kind of things. Yeah, and the equation isn't difficult as you mentioned, Michael. It's about deploying your money at the right place, the right time for the right reason. And, and that's the art of a property investment. I agree with you also that best time to invest is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Um, but 2022 will be different to 2021. You cover this in your Market Insights uh, report. I just want to get into some of those drivers. Now, the question being, Matt, uh, I think it's going to be different this year to last year. Can we get the same growth? I think most of the banks have indicated that uh, growth will slow. Uh, this year compared to last year. These are the same banks that told us two years ago that uh, property is going to drop by 40%. I'll just flag that. But um, what's going to be the, the key drivers in this market in 2022? Uh, and how is that different than 2021? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it's the million dollar question. Michael touched on it a little bit. Affordability is going to be key for a number of reasons. As if there is a risk or if interest rates do go up, then serviceability is going to bite and it's going to bite on the prestige properties and the higher end properties first where you need a lot more to get in. And 
banks are already starting to get wary of, of over lending um, to those into those markets. Now, the great thing about that's whether it's Sydney or Melbourne, some of their inner suburbs, even not necessarily the prestige suburbs, but just middle ring suburbs have done very well and they're well above the median house price. They've created a lot of equity. Um, they've, they're not likely to go up as much in the next 12 to 24 months because they are obviously um, pushing into a, an area where it's not as affordable and or a price point where it's not as affordable and those uh, any interest rate changes might impact that. The other thing that interest rates would do uh, in those markets is what we know is that as interest rates go down, share prices often go up and the inverse can be true as well as interest rates start to go up, obviously dampen share prices. We've seen the share market in the US come down about 10%. Now, when that happens, it obviously starts to impact the, the owners of shares. And while there's obviously a lot of big funds, it's largely the people in the inner suburban areas in the prestigious suburbs who are impacted through, through bonuses or obviously seeing their wealth change. So we're expecting to see those prestige markets being some of the toughest uh, in the next 12 months. But the affordable suburbs are going to have a lot of pressure because we're seeing immigration starting to pick up again. Um, we're expecting that the surplus vacancy in Sydney and Melbourne, which is largely a phenomenon of the, the high rise apartments and the student accommodation and kind of areas around universities, we're going to see that wash out as students start to fill those, um, those bedrooms again. And we're also going to see as new um, skilled migrants move into Australia again. And we, we expect that that's going to be at, at very high levels once again um, for a range of different, different reasons. Um, but the, that's going to put upwards pressure on rents in any of the affordable suburbs. And it's then also going to put upwards pressure on house prices where there's affordability. Now, what the, what's affordability in Australia is probably the, the next question. And it's different in every every city, but I would focus for investors, the most of the, the cities that have got the best fundamentals of affordability right now, as well as low vacancy rates, low stock coming to market and constraints on supply. I would say it's anything in Southeast Queensland. So it's Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, Brisbane, even out to Ipswich where it's very affordable right now. Um, Perth, the Northern suburbs, Southern suburbs as well. North, you're going about 40 kilometres north of the city or even northeast. Um, south, you can, you can still get an affordable property about 20 kilometres south of Perth. Um, and even in Adelaide, the fundamentals look pretty good in Adelaide. Now, the one thing I would offset that with is that Adelaide has Adelaide's grown its population around the same as a number of the other cities in Australia, which means that it hasn't really grown a lot in the last 24 months. Um, now, generally, when, the, when there's open international borders and there's lots of migration, we see that filter into Melbourne, we see it filter into Sydney, we see it filter into Brisbane, and we see it filter into Perth. We don't see as much population growth in Adelaide in the long term. So right now, fundamentals are great. Where do we see the immigration going in the future? I would expect that's going to be southeast Queensland and Perth, Sydney and Melbourne over Adelaide, which... Um, is obviously going to mean that maybe 12, 24 months out, it won't be quite as strong as, as Perth may be. Um, now, I haven't really touched on, uh, on Hobart, Darwin there. Um, they, again, haven't had as much of the, the benefit of um, net overseas migration in the past. Um, and Canberra is obviously a very, very tight market, but affordability is, is not as strong in Canberra as it is or in the ACT. Um, as it still is in those other cities that I've mentioned, um, which, which we think are going to get um, a lot of investment over the next, uh, next 24 months and still have a fair way to go in their price growth. So, um, yeah, I think, as I said, they're, they're some of the major drivers. And then there's interest rates. And that, again, you've, you've touched on, obviously, what's the outlook from banks or the RBA. It's a really tough one to, to predict because what, what we have seen in uh, in the US is they've started putting their interest rates up in the last uh, last quarter. Um, new purchases of homes has dropped by 10%. Now, when the US puts up their interest rates, everybody locks in interest rates for 10 years. So if interest rates go up, it only affects new home buyers, not existing home buyers. So they generally go a bit harder perhaps than, than Australia might have to 
Um, because if interest rates go up and most of the market's on variable or on fixed rates that'll come off in the next 12 and 24 months, then they don't need to adjust that lever very hard to see, obviously, across the economy, people start to change their buying decisions, not just about property, but the consumer goods as well. Um, but I kind of offset that with the only reason they're going to put up interest rates is to, to dampen inflation. I think property makes up about 26% of the CPI bucket or thereabouts. A chunk of that is for rents. So you go, if you put interest rates up, is it going to reduce rents? Probably not. It'll have the opposite effect. Uh, if they put interest rates up, if they're doing it to, to dampen house price growth, well, it's probably not going to be as necessary because we anticipate Sydney and Melbourne, which makes up 60% of Australia's market, is going to have less price growth this year anyway. Um, and if they're doing it to take the pressure off prices of supply, well, it's going to have a very, very blunt effect on that because prices of timber, steel, and all of those, um, most of the goods that we have to import are actually being driven by offshore um, and, and forces outside of Australia's control. So uh, it will be interesting to see how they play it, but certainly the language from the RBA is, um, is still fairly, uh, fairly passive around interest rates. So yeah, I think passive is a, pass is a fair, fair way to put it. And, and uh, it's been beaten up a lot, uh, interest rates, uh, interest rate rises moving forward. And we think about, you know, um, 2021 versus 2022, what worked last year versus what will work this year. Last year, we were investing in property on the basis that there shouldn't be interest rate rises until 2024 is what the RBA uh, or the market was sort of saying back then. Now they're sort of saying, is it June? Is it August? Who knows? A lot of it's going to be connected in with, with wage growth. Uh, and the RBA government has made it pretty clear that he's not going to tinker with rates until he actually sees real wage growth. Uh, how and when that happens, who knows? The unemployment levels are pretty low. But you know, for you, Michael, you know your job at OpenCorp very much is interpreting the, the the great sort of scientific data work done by Matt and his team, and and applying it into investment strategies for uh, property investors. With, with this sort of under the shadow of interest rate rises sooner rather than later. Um, how will that shape the way investors buy property in 2022 versus 2021? Does it really matter that much? Uh, and to your point, the best time to invest in property is when you can. Uh, should you do it in isolation to what will happen with interest rate rises? You took the words out of my mouth, Phil. Does it really matter? I think the uh, to my point before around you know long term buying, um, you know, prudent financial management is uh, you shouldn't be buying a property if you can only afford it today. Uh, and not factoring in buffers or, you know, what if what if interest rates go up because we're at record lows? Uh, who knows exactly when it's going to happen, but guaranteed it will at some point. <laughs> they can't, can't, can't say this low forever. Uh, but the, the main thing, and it's without doubt the, the most common question that we've been fielding in the last, you know, two or three months uh, from, from talking to, um, to potential investors and talking to clients, but I think the, uh, the way that we explain it to, to clients is, is this. It's, it's actually quite simple. Um, you know, interest rate rises and I guess the fear that that can generate typically comes from the fact that the mortgage that most people have is the mortgage on their own home. And as a result, uh, the full brunt of any increased cost by an interest rate rise is, is born out of post-tax income uh, where people have to cover 100% of that increase themselves. If we think about uh, investment, the investment landscape, however, uh, interest rates don't just go up because it's Tuesday. They go up in response to a range of economic factors that have that have occurred. And uh, you know, if 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 interest rates are going up, then economic growth is up. If economic growth is up, job creation is up, unemployment is down, wage growth is up as well. If wages are up, typically property prices are up and rents are up, uh, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of positive effects. On, on interest rates going up. And it's why, uh, while our clients look at me a little bit funny when I say this, I like it when interest rates come down because your portfolio is uh, cheaper to hold. I love it when interest rates go up because if the, uh, if the rent's gone up and, and wages have gone up and therefore tax benefits can offset the vast majority of any cost increase due to an interest rate rise or two, uh, then you know, I don't know too many people that wouldn't be happy to see a couple of hundred thousand in growth for you know another ten or twenty dollars a week out of pocket. So, especially when you know a lot of uh, a lot of properties today 
Um, or at least the, I guess that the smart acquisitions are, are well and truly cash flow positive uh, today anyway. So that's that's I think the the, the perspective to to keep on interest rates is is always budget. Uh, you know when you're looking at investment decisions on a higher rate than what they are today because they will go up. But uh, there are a lot of positives to come from the uh, you know, come for the property market as as interest rates rise and the the wider impacts on the economy. Yeah, and, and that uh, Michael is uh, the information you're not going to read in in your sort of more tabloid media. They'll be talking about um, interest rates going up. Uh, Australians are going to struggle because they need to pay X hundred dollars more. Uh, a month on their mortgage and it's going to impact everyone and everyone's going to go broke. Um, the very mature way to look at it is if interest rates are going up, that's a indication of underlying health of the economy. And if interest rates are going up, guess what? For property investors, your rents are probably going up as well. So a whole lot of things moving in unison. So it is positive in some respect, uh, depending on how uh, fiscally uh, responsible you are in being able to manage your portfolio and there's good outcomes for people uh, as a result of it. So don't get carried away too much when you hear about uh, interest rate uh, increases because it's one of those things every action is an equal and opposite reaction there's typically more income coming in your back pocket uh, as a result of interest yeah. rate rises i think you're you're spot on phil i think the other thing to to bear in mind um you know and and uh to, to shield yourself sometimes from the the sensationalist headlines that are there to sell papers and clicks uh you know that, that's what the tabloid media is there to do uh, and they do it very well uh, just remember that anyone that's borrowing money today, regardless of whether it's 400,000 or 4 million, uh, the servicing calculators that the banks are applying are factoring in interest rates being 3% higher than what they are today. So the talk out there around if interest rates go up a quarter of a percent, then all of a sudden, you know, it's there's, going to be, there's going to be mass, mass, mass sales and, and mass supply on the market is, is unfounded because interest rates could go up 3% tomorrow and anyone that's borrowed money can, can still afford to repay it in the bank size. So I think it's important just to keep some perspective on that, that there are, um, while the actual cash rate and retail rates are, are low, a lot of buffer has been built into, you know, the, uh, the prudent financial management among uh, APRA and the banks of late, especially. One of the really interesting things, which I'll, I'll throw out there too, it's a We've seen this in the US in the last six months as well, as interest rates started to go up, there was a big spike of purchases initially as people wanted to get in lock in their rate. In 2007, as we were going through an interest rate rising cycle, um, just like there was obviously the RBA didn't know that the GFC was coming. So they were trying to put, put the brakes on the Sydney and Melbourne housing markets. Prices actually escalated faster as they put up interest rates for the same reason. People want to try and get in while it's cheaper and lock in those interest rates. So again, if we do see interest rates starting to, to shift up or that RBA message going, starting to change from a passive to maybe a little bit more um, restrictive, then I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see another rush, which will, again, for those that are in the market or thinking about whether they should get in the market now or wait, um, obviously if you're in the market and that rush happens, then you're going to get the benefit of that. Um, and then, as, a, as Michael said, you get to, to get the benefit of increasing rents over time. And I'm pretty sure I saw the stats yesterday, 70% of our um, clients' tenants' portfolio um, in the last three months has had rents put up. And the average rent increase is, is over $30 a week. So um, we're, yeah, we're kind of already seeing that there's upwards pressure on rents. And that's going to continue. You know, think back to the GFC um, and how Australia fared versus other parts of the world, in particular the US, um, uh, was really good. Uh, a lot of it due to the sort of um, prudent way that our banking system has been created. And to your point, Michael, um, you know, sensibility is structurally factored into the banking system in Australia. Uh, banks don't lend money to people uh, if they can't afford it with a buffer involved. So most people should be able to absorb uh, increases to interest rates. Is what happens subsequent to that? Will it stop people buying or will it prompt people to what Matt was saying, to buy faster and you get another uptick, you know, who knows? We'll follow that through. Um, there's a lot moving, a lot of moving parts right now. And I really want to understand there's places which are good places to invest and there's probably markets uh, it's worth avoiding. So the question for me, Matt, is, you know, considering the interest rate dynamic, considering uh, the um, emergence of Australia outside of the COVID pandemic, 
considering uh, the opening of Australian borders and migration potentially come back in Australia or at least um, getting tourists into our restaurants and other places, stimulating the economy. Uh, is there going to be more money washing around uh, in Australia moving forward? Uh, I would think so. Uh, but that doesn't mean every single market in Australia is a good place to invest in. Uh, is there anywhere that you'd be sort of avoiding at the moment, markets and or regions uh, in 2022? Uh, look, I think um, it's, a, it's a great question because I think over the last two years, there's been some regions that have performed exceptionally well. Um, and we saw, and there was a lot of media around um, the, the city slickers moving out into to areas like, uh, like Ballarat, for instance, uh, mm. which was a, a large um, regional city, only an hour's drive from, from Melbourne. Other cities within an hour, hour and a half of Melbourne and Sydney did really well um, through that period. And actually wasn't because, like the data's shown now, it's not because of so many people moving from the city out to those areas. There was certainly a bit of that. It was also because the, the teenagers and the young adults and the people who may, maybe otherwise would have moved to the city chasing a job stayed put. So the vacancy rates got squashed. They, um, rent started to go up. Prices started to go up. Now we're starting to see people move back into offices again and more jobs opening up again in the city, hospitality and the like um, starting to get turned back on. So there is a risk that that's going to lead to a, a reversing of that trend with, uh, with people starting to move the other way while there's a bit of a construction boom happening in those, in those regional cities. I'd say one of the one that I would look at in the opposite where I think it, it didn't benefit as much, but it, it may benefit this year is Toowoomba. If you're looking at regional cities, um, Toowoomba, hour and a half drive from, from Brisbane, still a lot more affordable than Brisbane. And I'd expect that this year it'll probably perform well. Now, I caution people because I also say, if, I, if you're looking at that, look 24, 36 months into the future and what does the trend look like there? Uh, if you were chasing short-term gains, then then maybe that could work for you. But if you're looking at long-term and you're going to be holding a property for, for an indefinite period, um, then you would really need to look at that 36-month profile, which is really why we tend to move back to the cities with more than 200,000 people um, within kind of an hour's drive of a capital city um, and where there's a lot of different employment generators and there's going to be ongoing demand and um, and also where the, the skilled migrants will, will want to, to move to. Um, and yeah, I, I think, again, I mentioned them earlier, but obviously the Southeast Queensland trio of Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, Ipswich is exceptionally affordable right now. And despite the fact there seems to be, when you look at it from a map, there's a lot of land around Ipswich. It's coming out of the ground very slowly. Um, and so we're seeing obviously that putting pressure on prices. Townhouses in Brisbane, um, especially, I mean, we've seen townhouse prices go up 30%. Um, we see townhouse prices before the market sees townhouse prices because we're also a developer. We know what, um, what prices we're likely to be putting on townhouse projects that we're going to be developing. Um, and we've got some sites in Brisbane and um, we're, we're expecting that we'll be putting them to market probably $150,000 above where the, the previous market um, was looking. And that's just because there's no stock. Um, and so we've seen across Brisbane prices, townhouse prices go from 600,000 as an affordable townhouse. They're now at 850 to 900. Anything in that sort of kind of um, that pocket of Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, if you can get a townhouse under 650, under 700 uh, on a, on a, decent sized townhouse with good finishes, you're probably going to be doing very well. Um, and again, if I was looking in, uh, in, like in Sydney, for instance, we actually really like that southwestern pocket of Sydney where there is still a lot of infrastructure coming through supporting the um, the new is it the Aerotropolis? It's got some fancy Aerotropolis. Names. Sounds like yeah, it. it's Sounds everything. Like it's everything is Sydney is fancy, Matt. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely fancy. The, yeah, the, the question, right. Matt, around um, that's interesting to hear about townhouses uh, up in Brizzy. Uh, for me, you know, looking at sort of opportunities for for twenty twenty two, but sort of you know markets or regions to avoid your your concerns. I know you're developers, but your concerns around uh, the hike in um, uh, building materials and costs at the moment. Now, if, if you're developing in this market, you know, the numbers that you probably put together 
a year ago in terms of feasibility are probably very different to where they are today. And I see a lot of people and, and running in parallel with this, um, uh, the slowdown in new builds because builders are actually just finding reasons why they don't want to actually build properties at the moment because they're on fixed fixed price contracts where they just go, oh yeah, it's a three year waiting list to, to build a house right now. So this is a big problem, isn't it? Yeah, we um, look absolutely spot on. And there's two things, maybe three things that have happened uh, in the last few years that are not that are helping to cause that significant escalation in prices for townhouses. One, a couple of years ago, Brisbane City Council made a decision to make it a lot harder for a developer to get a townhouse approval. They just said, we don't want townhouses. So all of the inf little infill sites kind of got ruled out. Um, so that's mean that means there's less supply coming through. Then you've got construction costs going up. So developers aren't going to bring stock to market unless they're going to make a profit. So if they have to sit on it for longer until prices go up, they will. Um, we also saw Brisbane City Council change a planning scheme on apartments to increase the number of car parks that an apartment building needs to provide. In some cases, it's gone up by 80, 90% um, in terms of car parks. So it's adding $100,000 per unit to the cost of, cost of construction. So what, how does that play out? Developers just aren't bringing their sites to market. They're just sitting on them and they'll wait until prices go up. We've seen in Perth, some apartment developers sell out of a project off the plan and then park it and not build it because it costs too much to, to construct right now. So those things um, in the infill market are really cramping the ability to bring new supply, which is obviously when they can't bring new supply to market and you've already got low vacancy rates, and rents going up, it's going to keep that upward pressure on the market for at least 24 months. We can't see that kind of turning around at all. Uh, hence the reason why we're, we're very bullish on if it's sort of under Australia's median house price and you can get a, a townhouse or a, a house and land package in, in that market in Southeast Queensland, um, because the market can't create new stock at the rate that there's demand, um, you're going to most likely do very well in the next 12 and 24 months. Mm. Um, it just, re just reminds me of the laid complexity of, of investing in property in Australia. It's like, where, where do you say? Hence the reason why you think you guys have the business that you have. Um, uh, Michael, for you, um, you know, do you think regional areas will outperform the cities this year? And, and to what Matt said around these sort of areas and our uh, regional hubs an hour outside of the, the CBD. So, um, are they regional or are they just quasi-metropolitan these days? Who knows? Uh, I don't know where to start and stop with this, but your thoughts on regional areas or what constitutes regional moving forward? Yeah, well, I think um, the regional areas is an interesting one because it's uh, there's obviously a lot of talk about, about people moving out to the regions, but the data suggested it was a fraction more than what it had been uh, you know, I'm talking about 5,000 more people nationally than, than the year before. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's really a, a negligible figure. Uh, and, and as Matt talked, it was more the uh, existing population of the region staying that, uh, that caused the, the restriction on supply than it was a mass influx of, of population out. And, you know, just, just in casual conversation that I've had with, with a few people that live locally to me, it's already people that you know made that reactive decision to to buy a lifestyle property, uh, realizing that in the last three or four months they really haven't used it very much and was it a smart decision? Uh, yeah, I think we'll start to see some of that adjustment happening as well. So, um, you know, not everyone will be doing that straight away, obviously. But if if you're after you know consistent performance from your portfolio, there might be some regions that do very well for a short period of time. It's very hard picking picking those locations and picking exactly when they grow and when they grow quickly and when they'll stop and getting your timing, uh, you know, perfect. Um, so yeah, fo focusing on those, those larger, larger hubs uh, within, you know, an hour or so of, of a major capital city and the major capitals themselves, uh, we think is, is a far more reliable way to go in terms of uh, capital growth and, and uh, low vacancy rates and rental, rental performance. So, and I'll conclude with this uh, question, Matt. Um, when you look at 2021, everyone's going to, they're going to go, wow, it was great that I was in the market in 2021 and I got 20 to something percent uplift in my property values. I'm a genius property investor. And these are probably going to be the next generation of buyers agents, right? Who think everything they touch turns to gold. We've seen it all before and it doesn't necessarily work that way. But if 2021 has got to be identified with that, 
what do you think 2022 is going to be identified as? Uh, I think the people who, I think at the end of 2022, we'll look back and we'll hear some horror stories perhaps from some people, people talking down, like maybe not being as enthusiastic about their, uh, their experience. And we're going to have others who absolutely will um, be patting themselves on the back going, yes, I made the right decision for two reasons. One decision was they decided to buy in 2022 when there was still growth. Two, they decided to buy in the right place. And I think the right place is absolutely critical this year, more than the right thing. Um, because if you're in the right place, and we've talked about it a few times today, those fundamentals of like low supply, very tight vacancy rates, rents increasing, pressure on prices. Um, I mean, it, it's not rocket science, that, that part of it. If you have that mixture of ingredients, you're going to see price growth, even if there is a potential increase in interest rates. So I think the people at the end of this year who make money in property can pat themselves on the back. Um, and uh, and hopefully the others learn learn a lesson from it. Sounds like any other given year, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. And look, what one thing uh, that Matt mentioned about half an hour ago that it just um, ha- having some really positive stories in in years gone by. Uh, Matt talked about uh, the uh, prestige markets in especially Sydney and Melbourne maybe starting to feel a bit of a pinch with regards to demand and affordability. Uh, for, for those listeners that have got property in those markets, uh, the one thing that I'd really encourage them to do is, is use the growth that you've seen already. You know, be, be a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, based on the growth that's been seen, get your property revalued, extract any equity that is available. Uh, we saw clients do, do especially Sydney-based clients, uh, you know, late 2016, early 2017, um, take that kind of guidance. They'd seen, you know, 80 to 90 percent growth in their house price in the five years prior, extracted that equity and were able to, to buy multiple properties, you know, three to five uh, investments off the back of that growth, only for the median to then correct over the next 18 months by about 15 percent. Now, had they waited three months, it was probably one or maybe two investments they could have got. Uh, you know, those extra two investments by by you know being able to unlock their equity and taking that action has well and truly paid dividends five years later. So um, yeah, it's not just about what the, you know, what the market's going to do. It's understanding where you are and where your assets have performed and why, uh, how you can capitalize on that and position yourself, uh, you know, moving forward to take advantage of the opportunities out there, you know, right now. We just covered off some of the info uh, and, and thanks for the sort of pre-publishing insights. Uh, it's good to get it first um, in your 2022 uh, Q1 2022 market insights report. Um, so this is from OpenCorp from Jan to March this year. Uh, you can download it in the show notes uh, wherever you're listening to this right now. You can also just if you go to the OpenCorp uh, website. Um, you'll be able to download it there or just Google OpenCorp uh, market insights report. You'll be able to download it. That'll be available uh, by the time that you listen to this podcast. Uh, that's just a little bit of a taster about the sort of stuff in it. But it's a pretty big report, isn't it, Matt? There's no shortage of info in it. 83 pages in total. So uh, people who decide to read it will be forgiven if they don't read every page. Uh, obviously, <laughs> there's parts of it that are going to be more relevant to you than others. Um, but yeah, we, as I said, we it's a document we use to drive our own decisions as well. So hopefully it can be put to use by other investors. Sounds like a pretty good asset. Uh, as Matthew Lewis and CEO and Michael Beresford, Director Investment Service, OpenCorp. Gents, thanks for your time. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Always good to talk. Nice one. Now, remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Uh, plenty of info like this uh, from leading experts giving their insights on what's going on with property, how you can make more informed decisions. Uh, social media, Smart Property HQ, where you'll find us. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye.